Last week, I addressed the topic of newness, and I talked about new things, and it was a fun message. And I'm in the midst of all sorts of new things in my life. Uh, in every sector of my life, God is doing something new. And I cherish that. Uh, even at Ellerslie, this is a new season, meaning we're starting a new training season. And everything is has that new springtime bud uh, coming from it right now, some little flowers popping out, and you hear the chirping of birds in the background of every dimension of life. And that's fun. And this is sort of a contrasting message, not to say that God isn't doing new things. That's not what I mean by contrasting. It's to show a certain aspect of his nature, which is very, very pertinent and important when you are in a time of change, is to recognize that even though God is changing us, he remains the same. And even though his methods in different seasons are different with us, and the different ways that he works on us are different. The way he heals blind people, as I said, I think it was last week, rotates. He's like, just says, be healed. And the next time he uh, spits and you know in their eyes. It's like what in the world's that? He makes some mud cake and you know cakes it on there, smears it on there. The other time he says go wash in a pool. It's like ah, Jesus, could we be a little more consistent? He's doing the same thing. He's healing blind eyes, and even though he does it differently, he's the same God. And so to combine those two, to recognize that God does new things in our life, but to recognize that the moorings upon which we build our life will never be shaken. That when we fix ourselves to him as rock, when winds and rains beat against our life, he will never falter beneath us. We will be able to stand in the midst of whatever storm comes our way because we are built upon an unchanging God. So I think this will be a a refresher for many of us. This is a classic Ellerslie message, if I could say it that way. This is like old school Ellerslie, where we're going back to some of the most basic truths and just building outward. And so clothed in rainbow, uh, it's sort of hard to give a picture of God Almighty on his throne clothed in rainbow, right? And so we just have a hint of it in this little image uh, here, and I think it's very tasteful. Uh, and you've heard of Joseph and his, his dad is going to give him, and if you grew up in Sunday school, you, you, you heard about the coat of many colors and there was a little flannel board picture of, uh, Joseph and he had this coat of many colors. And it is a fascinating thing to realize that Joseph received basically a rainbow coat. And the significance of that is oftentimes lost on us as we are studying scripture, because it doesn't say a rainbow coat, it just says a coat of many colors. And yet the profundity of his coat, you see, Joseph is a messianic figure to every Jew. The Jews couldn't quite figure out how one man could fulfill all the messianic prophecies. And so it's rather remarkable to see that Jesus is actually going to do just that. He is going to fulfill all of them, but... Back in the day before Jesus is arriving, the Jews were trying to figure this out. It's like, well, this can't be one man. And so they broke up the messiahship into two men. They, they said, there must be two messiahs. So they had a, a David messiah, uh, which makes sense because we know that he has to come from the loins of David and he's going to be the son of David, you know, all these different things of the seed of David. Uh, you know, so, oh, okay, that, well, that one's one. But then you also have this Joseph one, a Joseph-like messiah. And so... They're right, there is a Joseph Messiah and a David Messiah, but they're all one. And so when you study David, you're going to see an incredible picture of Jesus. You're gonna see shadows of the one to come. But when you study Joseph and you see this man who is favored by the father, who is going to be rejected by his own brothers, who is going to be sold for pieces of silver by a guy named Judah, who in the way that they would say it is Judas, the brother is going to sell him to the Ishmaelites for pieces of silver. I mean, and then he's going to rise to the second place in command. Just think, under the father at the right hand, he is second under the father and then rule the nations and be a deliverer for all the nations in a time of drought. 
Yeah, I would say that's a pretty good picture of Jesus, right? But what did he have? He had something that set him apart. It was a special coat. It was a coat of many colors. So we're going to realize that it's not just Joseph that wears a coat of many colors. If you were to describe God, which happens multiple times throughout the scriptures, that you're, the, the writers in the scripture are going to see something. They're going to see God on his throne. I know that sounds a little strange, and that's a whole different study in and of itself. It's like, well, who are they seeing? And that, that's a great study even of, of Jesus uh, in and of itself, but we're not going there right now. But I'm going to call it God's coat of many colors, and I'm going to say he's clothed in rainbow. So let's just go through a few of those. Ezekiel 128, as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face and I heard a voice of one that spoke. Now, I don't know if you guys can catch the irony here that God is going to be marked by a rainbow in all of these different pictures that I'm about to read to you. And just think, you know, that the culture that we have today is trying to take what is actually God's symbol for themselves. And so it's really difficult even to use a rainbow today. In fact, some of you, when you even saw the word rainbow in my title, were a little concerned of where I was going with this one. And yet I'm going in the God direction with this. This is his symbol. I've oftentimes said like Zorro leaves a Z, God leaves a rainbow in the sky. It's a demonstration of his character that is unchanging. He said it way back then, he still says it today. Same God, same rainbow, same color scheme, same pattern of colors. It's never changed. So Revelation 4, 3, and he that sat, speaking of God, was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. So I have a picture for us to sort of enjoy, even though it's imperfect, okay? If you have to sort of squint on this one because it's close to being what I want, but it's not exactly right, okay? Because if you know your Roy G. Biv uh, color schematic, something's a little off uh, in this one order-wise, but I don't want you to get distracted with that. I want you to imagine that this is a perfect rainbow picture, and it's a picture of God. You know, see that, that, throne, uh, that crown up there? Isn't that powerful? A uh, great picture of authority, right? And then this is our God clothed in rainbow. I know he doesn't look like blocks, but that'll, that'll help with my illustration, okay? So the proper name of God, if you're going to build an understanding of God, you want to go with uh, it the way that God revealed himself. Think about who wrote the first five books of the Bible. His name's Moses. So Moses is going to encounter God. And he's going to encounter God in a bush. You guys remember that story after 40 years in the wilderness, you know, after the 40, 40th year is completed, he's going to encounter God because God has a mission for him. God wants him to carry a responsibility. Moses was ready to carry that responsibility 40 years earlier. He was ready in his own strength. He wasn't ready in God's strength. Those 40 years have weakened him to the point where he has no confidence in himself. And what I always say is that is what God needs to do in all of us. You see, Moses is actually now ready to do the work of one of the greatest leaders of all world history, is what Moses is going to be termed. Moses still to this day is considered by many who would ever look at it without getting skewed by the fact that he's a biblical character. He is literally the greatest or one of the greatest leaders of all time in human history. Now, before this, did you know that Josephus, when he writes about Moses, actually describes him as the mighty conqueror of the Ethiopians, that he was an Egyptian military genius, which is such a weird thought because most of us just sort of, you know, we have our Ten Commandments picked, you know, the movie uh, with Charlton Heston, you know, and then we have this new one, what, uh, Prince of Egypt, you know, and that's, that's like our picture of who Moses is. And yet there's a lot more to this man. He was trained at the highest levels, at the highest levels of intellect. He was groomed literally to be a pharaoh. And yet, when he finds out of his Hebrew roots, and he finds out that a Hebrew is being harmed, then he rises up to sort of be that deliverer in his own strength. And remember, he kills the Egyptian and buries him in the, in the sand, and then runs for his life uh, because Pharaoh isn't too happy about that. 
And then that's the reason he's even in the wilderness in the first place. It started with the right instinct. The same thing happens in our life where we start with the desire to please God. It's like, God, I recognize you've chosen me and called me. All right, I'll do this for you. But God needs to break us in the wilderness to ready us to the point where even Moses is like, I, I can't do this. I can't speak. He has no confidence in his own ability to speak. And so God's going to give him Aaron to speak for him. And what we see is the beginning of something, though. It's not just the beginning of Mo, or Moses. Am I given the right name? Have I been saying the right name? Have I been saying Moses the whole time? I had this thought that I was saying Abraham all of a sudden. It's like, uh-oh, after all this time? No, Moses, okay. So, but Moses is not just at the advent or the beginning of his own leadership story where he is going to see the world impacted. This is the beginning of what we know as the Bible. The man who is going to write the Bible is going to encounter God right here. He is going to begin to understand this God right here. Now, how he gains the revelation to write the first five books is quite an extraordinary thought. It very likely took place in those 40 days on the Mount of Mount Sinai when he is going to be face to face with God. And somehow this revelation is going to be given him. And we know that God says, write this down for a memorial in a book. But we are going to see God be the sponsor in and through this man of actually writing down the revealed scriptures. But let's go right back to the beginning. I'm going to call this the proper name of God. Exodus 3, 13 through 15. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, they shall say unto me, What is his name? And what shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. And God said moreover unto Moses, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me unto you. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial unto all generations. It is somewhat of an odd thought to think of God having a proper name. Now, I'm, I'm calling it that. I don't, God doesn't say, this is my proper name. He says, this is my name. And we also know, if you study scripture, that God has a lot of names. However, there's something about this name that seems to be like the official name. You know, like my kids have a lot of nicknames, but then they have one like official legal name. Yeah, it's sort of like that. I would look at this as like the proper name. And it's odd to think that God has a proper name. Now, we don't describe, we don't usually call him I am that I am. That isn't what we would say. In fact, the Jewish people will not even say that name. It's called the ineffable name, which is another way of saying unspeakable. It's not that you can't speak it. It's that they're afraid of using it in vain because it's one of the commandments. Thou shalt not take the name, speaking of this one, of the Lord in vain. That's actually this name. You should never mishandle, misuse this name. It is never, that's called blasphemy to do it. And so they don't even speak it. The only one in the culture that speaks it is the high priest when he goes in on the day of atonement into the Holy of Holies. That's a pretty extraordinary set of partners for a name, which then gives you insight into understanding when we're brought in to the throne room of grace by the shed blood of Jesus, and Jesus is given a name above all other names. You think about that, and that we are supposed to use the name Jesus. What a luxury that we've been invited into. The entire Jewish people would never even say the proper name of God, and now we have been given a great revelation of who this God is in and through the person of Jesus. And we are asked to pray in that name, to preach in that name, to do everything we do in that name. The ineffable name. So it's called the Tetragrammaton, if you, if you study it, and that's, uh, we have four letters, those, those are not Hebrew letters, but we, you know, that no one spoke this name, so no one actually knows how to pronounce it. We will typically say Yahweh, like if you've ever heard that, that's where it comes from, but it's technically a guess, because you could say Yehovah, Yehovah, and you would be just as accurate, right? No one actually knows, I'm sure there's better guesses than others, right? 
But this means and translates to the I am, but that's not as full of an understanding. It's, it's from the verb to be. And so to just say I am doesn't quite cover the gamut of what this means because it also could mean I was, and it could also mean I always will be. It just means I'm the same. I was and I am and I always will be this way. This is who I am. So another way of describing it is the always, the continuous, the never-ending, the perpetual, the same. That's who God is. If you want to know God, this is actually critical for your foundation because faith needs to rest upon something, and it's not wishful thinking. It's something strong, and this is the foundation of the house that God is wanting to build in your life. This is what it starts with. He digs a hole out, excavates out a hole that is perfectly suited to faith in God. But what he fills that hole with is a foundation, and that's what this is. This is what the Spirit of God wants to convince you of, is that he is, in fact, I am. The most elementary attribute of God, and that's what I'm going to call this. This is the foundation stone understanding of God. I amness, eternal sameness, forever alwaysness, unchanging everness. Not words that we would typically use, but, you know, it's something like that. His unchanging everness. Don't you like the word everness? Doesn't it sound like a word we should use more often? His everness. It's just, it has a beauty to it. Like you want to use it in a, poet, a line of poetry or a song. So his unchanging everness. This is his nature. This is who he is. And this backs up so much of what you're going to learn about God in your life. So whenever you see Jehovah, Jehovah is another name for I am that I am. Remember, the Jews wouldn't ever say the Tetragrammaton or the Yahweh. They would never even utter it. And so they came up with what's called a euphemism, which is a creative way of honoring God without saying his name, but by saying sort of a substitute name for him that means the same thing. Jehovah is that substitute, okay? For us, Yahweh, Yahweh, Jehovah, there's various ways of saying it. In the Aramaic, it's Adonai. You'll see in Scripture, all caps, Lord. It's just a creative way of saying the same thing, sort of like my kids call me Daddy. And it's really awkward if they call me Eric Winston Ludi. It's like it's Daddy to you. And in a strange sense, that's the way the kingdom of heaven works, is the Jews, to show deference to him, did not call him by his proper name, but called him by the euphemism, Jehovah, or Lord. And so the same is for us as we begin to gain this basis and you begin to see the revelation of God, what are you going to see? You're going to see the name Jehovah in front of a lot of other descriptors. And what would that mean? So if you find out that he is Jehovah Shalom, Lord of peace, right? Jehovah, the God of peace. What does that mean? That means he was the God of peace. He was peace. He is peace and he always will be. How about healer? He was, he is, and he always will be. You see, this is a foundational understanding that when you get his Jehovahness, you recognize that this is who he is and he cannot alter. He cannot change. It is impossible for God to change. So when you find out that he's the truth, you know that he cannot lie. And so your entire reasoning as a believer in relationship to this God is based on the fact that he is always the same. So when you grab a hold of who God is, you can know that he will never alter from that. And so what you believe today can be just as true tomorrow. And I remember getting all excited when I was teaching Hudson math and I recognized, uh, it was just sort of like that fresh revelation to me when I was teaching him two plus two equaled four. And I, I mean, it was just like, this is so profound, buddy. Now he was around two plus two equaling four. You know, he was around four, right? He, so he's looking at me and wasn't as impressed with the truth as I was saying. It's like, did you know that two plus two equals four and it always has and it always will? That means you can build your life upon that as fact. There's all sorts of things that change in this world, but not that. That will always be the same for 10 million years into the future. Two things plus two other things equals four things. And he just sort of sat there and stared at me. 
But spiritually speaking, if you get this, that means when God reveals himself to you through his word, you can take it to the bank. It's not going to change. This is who he is. He was this, he is this, and he always will be this. Now, I don't know if you're tasting that, but that is surety. That is confidence. That's what's called faithfulness. He will never alter on you. He is not shifting sand. In him is no shadow of turning. See, this is what gets me excited. This is the basis of the Christian life. Hebrews 11.6. This is gonna, the writer of Hebrews is going to say the same thing. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, I underlined and made bold the first part of that because that's what I'm pressing on right now. If you're going to come to God, you first need to be prepped by the Spirit of God to know something. And that is that he is. You could say he is what? No, no, that's the whole point is he is. Jesus is the I am. Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of what we see as God in the Old Testament. He is God made manifest. So he is, when you see him, you are seeing the Father. And if we know the Father as the I am, then Jesus is the fulfillment of that. He's the revelation of that. Jesus is the I am. So, but we don't say it that way. When you're describing Jesus, how do you say it? You say, he is. You don't say, I am. You say, he is. And so when you see that scripture in Hebrews, when it says they must believe that he is, that makes total sense. John 8, 58. Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. By the way, they weren't too impressed with this and they picked up stones to stone him. Why? Because he was blaspheming. Remember what blasphemy is? It's taking in vain the name of God. He is actually saying that he is. He was, he is, and he always will be. Jesus said that before Abraham was. Abraham is from a long time before, and he is saying before Abraham, I am. Whoa, what? Is he going to get away with that? Well, he's God. This is exactly the truth. Revelation 1.8 and then 22.13. I am Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. John 8, 24, for if you believe not that I am, you shall die in your sins. You see, the he is actually added to help us read it, but it's not there. What he's actually saying, for if you believe not that I am, you shall die in your sins. Isn't it interesting to see the importance that Jesus himself puts upon us knowing that he is? That's not a small statement there. To even come to God by faith, this is something that exists in us, that we know that he is, which means he was this way, he is this way, and he always will be, because we're 2,000 years after that cross work, after that love was expressed, after that word was written down to chronicle it, and then we're 2,000 years later. What if he changes? If he changes, I mean, what, what surety do we have that if we come to him by faith, he's going to meet us the way he promises in Scripture? You see, you must know that he is sure, that he is consistent, that he is always the same. It is essential for your faith. Hebrews eleven six. Here's the same scripture we read earlier. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You see, if you believe that he is, what is he? I mean, he could be an honorary character. He could be fickle. Imagine if you believe that he is. Yeah, he's always been the same. He, you know, yesterday, today, and forever. But he's one mean dude, right? And that's your conclusion. Yeah, and he doesn't like people like us. 
Okay, if that's the way he has always been, well, that's not going to change, right? That's a sort of a sad statement, but this is called good news that is being dished out. You see, the nature of God has been revealed. He is, and he will never change. What is it that he will never change from? He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. That means if you desire him, he will reward that. How do you even desire God? It's because he desired you first. The fact that you even have a desire for God is a demonstration to your soul. It's like a signal to your soul, a testimony to your own soul that God is after you. Because you can't find God on your own. He's after you. And the fact that you long for him is a signal to you that God wants you. And so if you diligently seek him, guess what? There is a guarantee on the table. He was this way, he is this way, and he always will be this way. What is it? He will reward your diligent seeking. You go after God, you will find God. When you reach out your hand, we had a, a thing in junior high where you, you'd stick out your hand to, uh, to shake someone else's hand, and then they'd reach out to take yours, and you'd go, sake. Yeah, see, that was really cool. Aren't you guys impressed with that? Wouldn't you be impressed with a little junior higher doing that? And that it was like an epidemic every time. And so you wouldn't even trust people. You know, when they stick out their head, are you going to psych me? It's like, well, I don't know. I, I'm not planning on doing it. And then they're like, psych. It's like, oh, I was psyched again. It was terrible. Uh, and so some of us have looked at God the same way. He sticks out his hand and says, take my hand. But we're afraid that he's going to pull the psych thing on us. It's called fickleness. But God doesn't change. If he sticks out his hand, he means it. And for you to know that spiritually is of the utmost importance. When you read a promise in scripture, it's God sticking out his hand. Take it. Take my hand. But God, are you, are you going to be faithful? Are you, are you going to still be there when I reach out my hand as I put my trust in you? Guaranteed. And that's why this is the foundation of our faith. We need to know that he is going to be there, that he is faithful and true, that he is rock. When we plant our roots into him, we will not be shaken. He is. So the two factors of faith, number one, we'll call it the facts. He is. He was, he is, and he always will be the same. Number two, the promise. He is a rewarder. You see, we know that he is, okay, say we've established that. He was, he is, and he always will be the same. But what is he? What is he? Like, I mean, he could be a lot of things, but he is a rewarder. Why? He doesn't have to be, but he is. You see, he cannot alter. So when you discover who God is, he's always going to be that way. Isn't it an amazing thought to think? Because imagine if you didn't know anything about God. And you just find out that behind this door is all the truths about God. And they will never alter. He will always be that way. He cannot change. And then you open the door. It's like a little scary because what are you going to find behind that door? You could find one mean guy. You could find one of those dads, you know, that sits there in his Barker lounger reading a newspaper and totally ignores his kids. You could find, you know, a father that has no interest in you. Instead, you walk in and what do you find? Love. Love that so deeply desires you that he would lay down his own life to gain you. Whoa, when we walk into this room and discover his nature, it is so extravagant so generous, so patient, so kind, so merciful. That's what we find. And guess what? It will never alter. That is who he is. All right, guys, remember my, my picture that I had here, my rainbow king picture? Uh, I know you guys were very impressed with that. And you were wondering if that was going to come back into this. And there it is. So on the very bottom, we're going to lay a foundation. He was and is to come. His unchanging everness, or he is unchanging everness. Okay, that's your foundation. Let's build upon that. Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So what do we need to be able to come to God? We need to know that he is. But what is going to reveal that to us? The word of God. And so this becomes another foundation stone. He is the word of God. He is the manifest revelation of who God is. Now, I've, I've said this many times in the past, but it bears repeating right now. A word is a communication or a carrying device. So if I have a thought in my head and it's invisible, you're going to have a tough time figuring out what it is. 
So, but what if I clothe my thought in a word? And then I shoot it out into the, you know, the ether, and it goes around and it goes right in your ear canal into your mind. Suddenly you're able to unpack it and understand the invisible thought in my head because I used a word to clothe it. This is exactly what the Father has done. The Father has revealed himself to us. The invisible has been revealed. Why and how? In and through a word. In and through the word, Jesus Christ. Now that word is in text, and that word is also in person. But that is the revelation of God, which says something to us. What is that? He desires to be known. God doesn't need to reveal himself to us, but not only is he the I am that was and is and always will be the same, but that I am wants to be known. He wants relationship. He wants to reveal himself to us. That's an amazing quality. So it says in the second block, he is the word of God. And on the other side, he has made himself known. Psalm 99.9. Don't you like that scripture reference? Isn't that a cool scripture reference? The Lord our God is holy. Now it's hard to describe. Like when I say that this is the, the order of how, the, how it's all built, there are some debatable points here, right? I'm starting with this, and I, I've taught this many times in the past, that holiness is one of the most crux foundational attributes of God. You know what the word doesn't even make sense and is not even needed if sin doesn't enter the world? Because what holy even describes is something other than. And so why would you need to describe something other than if everything was an extension of God? But when sin entered the world, something other than God was present. And so to explain that, the word holy becomes essential. Because God is holy, and this earth that is now under the curse of sin is not and we fall into that category of unholy. We are actually not like God. God is holy. We are unholy. And this attribute is very, very important because we need to recognize that God was and is and always will be the same. He's not the one that is going to change. Something needs to help us, which is going to help you understand the gospel. God desires relationship with us, but something is warped inside of us, and he is holy. So this cannot alter. He cannot change who he is. For, to him, for him to have relationship with us, there is something essential that is going to need to be done. So the third block, we have he is holy. There is no darkness in him. Ezra 9.15, O Lord God of Israel, thou art righteous. Now there's a lot of scriptures for these things. I'm just giving one, just to make it a simple uh, exercise. So what do we see? He is righteous. So when we say he was and is and always will be, well, what is he? He's always been the word, he's always been holy, and he's always been righteous. And so if you were to look at righteousness as the way God is and the way man ought to be, it's a behavioral thing, but it also has a legal element to it. That here's God's nature, here's God's law, and here we measure up to it. God passes the test, the righteousness test. He is as the law demands. He is perfect in relationship to it, or he's just. We, on the other hand, are not. So it says on the right, even though it's sort of hard to read, and I have to admit that's not very easy to read, it says he is perfectly and legally just and right. He is righteousness. So as you begin to see this increase, you know what it's doing? It's actually explaining to your soul your need of salvation. Because something is off in you. You're not holy and you're not righteous, but he is. You see, there's a separation. This is who your king clothed in rainbow is. 1 John 4, 8. You see, what those first four blocks are explaining to us is what we could call law. They were explaining to us even what we could call bad news. It's sort of strange because it's not bad news in and of itself. It is bad news for us. The fact that God is and always will be the same and that God, the fact that God is the word of God uh, and the fact that he is holy and righteous is not bad. It's just for us, we can't mimic it. We have no capacity to enter into fellowship with a God who is so opposite of us. But as it says in 1 John 4, 8, God is love. And so it says, he is love. He brings us life even at his own expense. Think about that. Think about that line. He brings us life 
even at his own expense. This is who he was, and he is, and he always will be. So yes, he is holy. Yes, he is perfect righteousness. And yes, it's true that we are not. But he is also love, as it says in, first John, or I'm sorry, it says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Okay, guys, there's a reason why people carry that around as a mantra, even though we get so used to that scripture that it actually loses its zest to us. It is a remarkable statement. Even at his own expense, he will give to you his best to save you and to see you live. Oh, remarkable. Now that top block, I know all of you are very intrigued to see where this is going, and I have it on the screen here, so it's sort of a giveaway. But grace. Now, grace is a hard word to describe, and I, I've given many messages and given many definitions, and I, I don't contradict. It's just that there's a lot to it, and that's why it's called the manifold wonder of grace. And so manifold meaning many folds. It's like if you were to stretch out some kind of quilt thing where you have a whole bunch of squares, and they're sewed next to each other, and they all line out, and they're all a different color. They could all be a different attribute or aspect of grace, and then you could fold it all up into sort of like this pile, and you could say, this is grace. And yet it's a whole bunch of different claws of different color. And that's Scott. You see, grace in its most simple sense is God working on our behalf. You could also add to that to accomplish what we couldn't accomplish and only he could. You see, when he saved us, he saved us by grace. He worked for us. It was him working on our behalf, accomplishing something we couldn't accomplish on our own and only God could accomplish. So how are you saved? Well, you're saved by grace. Now, a lot of people will say grace is like mercy or compassion or gentleness, and I'm not going to argue. Those are part of the clause. However, if you stack them all together, you're going to see the power of God working on our behalf to express his love to us. It's God doing something for us. This is how you're saved. Well, how do you live your Christian life? Uh, by grace. You didn't think it was going to be up to you to muscle your way through this, did you? You see, you are not just saved by grace, you are enabled by grace and saved by grace every single moment of the day. When a temptation comes, how did you expect to overcome it? Well, what was your strategy? Were you going to dig in your own pockets and say, God, I got this one. Thanks for saving me up to this point, but I'll take it from here. The only way to be saved in the first place, this God who was and is and always will be, this God who has expressed himself and revealed himself to be holy and righteous, praise God that this God is also loving. And he loves us so much that he gave. Didn't just give us Jesus at the cross 2,000 years ago. He gives us Jesus now. You see, he gives us Jesus now. The nature of God is given to us now so that we could win, so that we could overcome, so that we could be victorious in the here and now. Some of you are in very challenging situations. It's funny. At any point in time, at any church, I could make that statement, and it's always true. It's remarkable how challenging life is, that there are so many ripples and very few moments in life where you could say, you know what? I have no need of grace right now. I cannot think of a moment, and if I ever have that moment, <laughs> Lord Jesus, I know something is just around the bend, because life is full of these ripples and is full of challenge, and it's, it has those trials and those difficulties woven into it, and that's actually a gift. And if we have grace, we surf upon it as opposed to being smothered in that wave. And that's what God wants to give us. He wants to lift us up above it. It's like grace is that surfboard that can actually lift us out of that water, that chill and enable us to take the trials and the difficulties in our life and reveal the power of God through them. So let's look at a short list of impossibilities. The Bible actually does enunciate a rather hefty challenge. You know this God that is giving us, you know, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's revealed himself to us so we could know him. 
and he's made it clear that he's holy. He's not like us, and he's righteous. He's perfectly uh, in agreement with the law of God. And then we, he looks at us and says, how are you doing? Uh, you know, I'm not doing that good over here. And he says, by the way, let's add a few things to that just in case you're starting to feel comfortable uh, thinking that you're all right. Uh, I need you to be perfect as I am perfect. I need you to be holy as I am holy. You shall love as I love, forgive as I forgive, and be pure as I am pure. How you doing? You see, God is going to allow that standard to be raised. Now, it's funny because some of us will still try in our own strength to do it. Even when we stare at that. I used to stare at be perfect as I am perfect. And I just gritted my teeth that I was going to do that. And I'm sure there's some of you in here that are similar to me. You're very disciplined. You're very hardworking. And you're going to show if there was one human on earth that could do this and fulfill this, I'm going to be that one. And yet I wasn't that one. There's only one. And I remember telling Hudson the gospel years ago, and this is what I said. I said, there's only one that is actually deserving of entry into the kingdom of heaven. One. Only one has ever walked this earth that is actually able to fulfill the righteous requirements of the law and earn a place in and through his own doing, in and through his own righteousness into that heavenly courtroom. One. And his name is Jesus and you're not him. That means every single one of us outside of Christ need assistance. We need salvation. We need an advocate. We need a high priest. And this high priest opens up his side and says, climb on in. What faith is, is climbing into Jesus' work. Climbing in to him as holiness. Climbing into him as righteousness. And that is our avenue through the love of Jesus into that throne room of grace. That's how we do it. It wasn't ever dependent upon our doing. It's dependent upon his doing. It's funny how in Christianity, especially in the conservative rendition, we can hear about Christ's work and we're like, thank you, Lord. You did great. And then we immediately turn back to ourselves and say, okay, it's now up to me. I don't know why we have a propensity to do that. It's something to do with our conservatism and our own self-righteousness. The Pharisees had the same issue, right? And we never want to be lumped in with the Pharisees, but we have a tendency to gravitate towards that because we esteem truth. We esteem righteousness. We esteem holiness. We want to honor our God. It's good motives. But we are actually healthier in our spiritual life when we remember he was, he is, and he always will be the same. He has revealed himself to us, that he is holy and that he is righteous. What also comes with that revelation? And you are not. You, in fact, are a lawbreaker. You are opposite the nature of God. And as a result, are destined to be separate from God for all eternity. And there's a place reserved for the devils that now you get to share. And it wasn't intended by God that you go there. But because you are in a state of rebellion, you will go there. Unless, dot, 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 unless, unless, unless what? That's a good question, says God. God likes us asking that question, unless you humble yourself, you repent and turn away from your wickedness and believe, believe upon the Lord Jesus. And when you put your trust in a God who is, who was, who is, and always will be the same, who is perfect and able and fulfilled all the righteous requirements of the law, you will discover an avenue of entry. But why have you received this? Why have you even heard of this? Why has this been made known to you? It's because our God is love. That is why you even know about it. But how is he going to save you? He is going to come and do it himself. The God of all grace. 1 Peter 5.10. He's just known as the God of all grace. Now that's revealed in so many different ways but that's quite a great statement of who our God is. If you want to know the nature of our God, there it is. So guys, we have our rainbow. The attributes of God that are constant in his life. He was, he is, and he always will be the same. That means that these attributes will never change. Some people think that his holiness and his righteousness somehow no longer is real in the New Testament. That once Jesus died on the cross, it sort of like nullified holiness and righteousness. It didn't. It fulfilled them. 
He still is who he is. And he still has a righteous requirement for entry into the kingdom of heaven. Did you know that? That didn't alter. However, Jesus has fulfilled that, which means if you believe in him, you enter into him as clothing and he becomes your righteousness. And you have access into the throne of grace. The same standard exists, but there is a solution found in Jesus Christ. Uh, guys, I don't know if we can read that. Uh, he... Uh, Something about labors on our behalf to save us, but uh, he ever labors on our behalf to save us. I think that's what it says, but somehow Eric needs to fix this in the future where uh, I can read my own notes. Hebrews eleven six. this is what we started with, guys. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is. So this is where it starts. And then what? and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You see, you need to know that God always was the way he is, and he'll never change. But you also need to know that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Or another way of saying that is, he is inclined toward your benefit. You need to know that your God is leaning towards you with his hand outstretched saying, take it. It's who he is. He's always been this way. The devil will try and con you into thinking that he has rejected you. But our God is, and he is a God of mercy. He is a God of love. He is a God of patience. He is a God of kindness. And our God desires to set you free, to see you saved. So what I have on the bottom portion is the he is. This is who he is. And then I have he is a rewarder. He is love and grace. So yes, he is, but he's also a rewarder. How about the law and grace? You see, even though the Old Testament is going to reveal the love of God, it's not that it's, it's not going to reveal that. It's not that it's not going to reveal grace, but it's a foreshadow. You see, we've been cut off from the throne room of grace. It doesn't mean God isn't grace. He is the God of all grace, even in the Old Testament. However, we, as humanity, didn't have access to that grace. And so what's going to happen in the New Testament is Jesus is going to come as an extension of that love and make a way for us to enter into that throne room of grace, where we will have grace for help in time of need. Whew. Uh, which, as far as I'm concerned, is every moment of every single day. So you might as well come boldly into the throne room of grace. How are you going to do that? By faith in Jesus Christ, because he's your righteousness. And then just stay there. It's called abide. Abide there. Abide in that throne room, that life supply location where everything you need for life and godliness is available to you. Jesus. So we can call him the always savior. It's interesting because his name, Yeshua, which is the, uh, the Hebrew name that Jesus was given, we just translate it as Jesus or Isus or Jesus, because the Koine Greek doesn't have a J sound. So when you stick it in the English, we end up with Jesus. It's not some weird way of, I've heard some people say it's Zeus. It's like, no, no, it was Isus, and it's not Zeus. I don't know what Zeus, you know, I have, we have nothing to do with that. Uh, however, Jesus, we call him the always Savior. His name means, in the Hebrew, Jehovah saves. What does that mean? He did save. He does save and he always will save. Think about that, guys. You, you have to land this in your soul. He did save, but think about right now, present tense. He does save. That includes you. See, some of us eliminate the ability of God to save us because we blew it. I'm like, oh, well, yeah, well, I blew it. I mean, how can God save this mess? I even knew what I should have done, and I didn't do it. Yeah, but he's a savior from sin. Now, you got the perfect deal right now. Jesus does save right now. And guess what? He always will save. This is who he is. This is his name. He's the always savior. John 8, 29. And he that sent me is with me. The father has not left me alone. For I do always those things that please him. Hebrews seven twenty five. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him seeing he always lives to make intercession for them. God is always living to make intercession for you and me. 
incredible thought, guys. If you just spend your, the rest of your life meditating on that one simple statement, it will change you. He ever lives to make intercession for you. Wow. So when Jesus was on the cross, what was he doing? He was making intercession for us. I was like, we understand that, yeah, way back then in the day. But what about today? You know, the same thing that led him to give up his life for you then is the same energy, strength, and passion that he has to give towards you today. That's a lot of energy, strength, and passion, guys. The always people. So we know that Jesus is an always savior, but did you know that we as the body of Christ, are meant to reveal who he is? Well, what do we know about him? Well, let's see. He is, he was, he is, and he always will be the same. Uh, he's the revelation of the word of God, you know, and so we can actually know God by watching him. He's holy, he's righteous, he's love, and he's grace. Uh-oh, guys, did I just describe what we are supposed to reveal as the church? That we're supposed to be an always people, Always the same. No matter what the circumstances around us, bombs are going off, and guess what? We still believe in our Lord. We're still marked by joy and peace and love. We still are turned outward in the midst of crisis. Everyone is lining up their, their cars at a gas station, and you're like, huh, what's going on? You see, you remain the same even though the world loses its head. You're a Christian, and you are a living epistle. So we have the foundation and that's, he was, he is, and he always will be the same. And then, you're the revelation of the word of God. You're not the word of God like Jesus was, but in and through you, the word of God is supposed to be clear. It's supposed to be understood. We're supposed to see the invisible God in and through our lives as the church. We're supposed to showcase the otherness of Jesus. We're supposed to showcase the otherness of God. Who he is is actually supposed to be revealed in us. We're supposed to be holy righteous. We, Jesus is our righteousness. We are supposed to actually begin to demonstrate that in and through our lives. The love of Jesus is the chief hallmark of our life. You will know my disciples by their love for one another. And grace. We are people who live by grace. So the always people, Christians, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Isn't that a weird statement to think about that? Because I would say it's the, it seems like it's more the opposite of that that I've witnessed in my growing up years, that Christians have a tendency to go up and down with their difficulties. But what if you recognize that you're supposed to be an always people, that no matter what is going on around you, you remain the same? Don't you like being around people that are like that in the first place? Isn't it a, a very uh, pleasant thing when crisis could be taking place, but the person that you're hanging out with is at rest and at peace and to totally marked by faith. You see, it's easy to believe when things are going well. It's a little more challenging when everything goes dark. And yet, why, did anything change, guys? Did God alter? In the meantime, just because the lights got turned out, did God turn off? No, he's the same. So our confidence is in an always God, even though the world around us isn't always healthy. And so our job is to hold on to the always God. And so when things go dip down or dip high, we hold on to a God that does not change. So we don't need to change. So I say it here, here, the always people, Christians, they're supposed to be the same yesterday, today, and forever. The ones in whom the always Savior lives, moves, and has his being. Leviticus 6.13, the fire shall always be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. And so when we see this tabernacle of witness, what an incredible statement, tabernacle of witness. That's what we are. We're a tabernacle of witness, and there's supposed to be a fire that is always burning in this tabernacle. Always. It never goes out. So listen to this collection of scriptures. I think you guys will like it. We set the Lord always before us, and because he is at our right hand, we shall not be moved. Psalm 16.8. We are always to pray. Luke 18.1. And without ceasing, make mention of others always in our prayers, Romans 1.9. We thank our God always, 1 Corinthians 1.4. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, 1 Corinthians 15.58. For he always causes us to triumph in Christ, 2 Corinthians 2.14. We are always bearing about in our bodies the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our bodies, 2 Corinthians 4.10. We are always confident, 
2 Corinthians 5, 6. And due to his abounding grace, we always have all sufficiency in all things in order to abound to every good work, 2 Corinthians 9, 8. We are giving thanks always for all things, Ephesians 5, 20, and always making our requests with joy, Philippians 1, 4. And we are always magnifying Christ in our bodies, whether it be by life or by death, Philippians 1, 20. We are always obeying, Philippians 2, 12. We are rejoicing in the Lord always, Philippians 4, 4, praying always, Colossians 1, 3, and our speech is always with grace, seasoned with salt. That far, sorry, guys, the, the uh, reference on that one got clipped. Colossians is what we have. How's that for uh, help in finding that one? We are always laboring fervently for others in prayer, Colossians 4.12, and giving thanks to God always for others, 1 Thessalonians 1.2. We always follow that which is good, 1 Thessalonians 5.15, and we rejoice always, 1 Thessalonians 5.16. We are bound to thank God always for our brothers and sisters in Christ, and we pray always, 2 Thessalonians 1.3.11, and then 2 Thessalonians 2.13, making mention of others always in our prayers. We have been given a coat of many colors. Remember that coat, that special coat that Joseph received? It showed special favor from his father. And then Jesus is going to be the fulfillment of the special son that is going to be betrayed by his own brothers and uh, sold, in this case, uh, unto the Romans to be crucified. However, he wears a coat. It's a nature. It's something that has changed the world. And we, just like Elijah when he was taken up in the chariot of fire, his mantle (laughs) flutters to the ground and Elisha picks it up and puts it on. Actually, he smacks the Jordan River and says, uh, uh, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And it parts. It's like, yeah, kind of like that. That's our coat. We've been given a coat of many colors, a coat that reveals a God who was and is, and always will be the same. So we have been given this coat of many colors. Get this, guys, to wear. Isn't that an amazing thought, that we have been given it to wear? And so when I ask, you know, the students at Ellers, I say, what is your position? I could say, what are you wearing? And they could say, a coat of many colors, and that would be accurate, right? But they would say, in Christ is their position. By faith, when we believe in Jesus, we enter into Christ. We enter into his righteousness. We enter into his work on the cross so that his work at that cross becomes our work. We enter into his resurrection. His newness of life becomes our newness of life. We enter into his ascension. His seated position at the right hand of the Father becomes our position. And all things are beneath his feet. His seated position of all authority becomes ours. Oh, All we did was believe. But because he so loved us and so loves us, he has shared and imparted to us his position. It is the greatest thing you could ever imagine that we have access to. And so when we wear this coat by faith, then he wears us. And that's called the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That his very spirit His very grace lives in us, moves in us, and has his being within us. And that is Christianity. So what we went through today was foundations. That's what it was. It's foundations. How does this all work? It works through faith. But faith in what? Not just faith in something that we make up, a golden calf God, but in the God that is revealed in Scripture. We have faith in him. But what he is is so astounding, so grand, that it actually should hush our souls with fresh awe. He is good. He is loving. He is merciful. And he has chosen us. He has pursued us. He has wooed us to himself to the point where all of us in here could just stand back and marvel and say, why me? And yet... He has revealed himself to us because he loves us so that we could be saved. So we have been given a coat of many colors. It's Jesus. Let's wear him that he might wear us. Father, I ask that you would showcase your life to us and through us today. Lord, I pray that we would 
situate our foundation upon you, that we would build our life with confidence upon your I amness. Lord, that we would remember that as we gain a grip of who you are, it will never alter. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for revealing yourself to us, and we cherish that today. It's in the precious name we pray. Amen.